everybody. This is Catalina. I hope you have been doing well. I've been looking forward to giving you guys a lecture. So this is what we came up with. So I'll be going over plants, plant form and function, and water and sugar transport in plants. The objectives for this lesson will be for you to differentiate the two major vascular tissues in plants, xylem and phloem. And then you will also be able to describe the functions of xylem and phloem in plants, including translocation and phloem loading and unloading. Let's go ahead and take a look at the vascular system in plants. So similar to humans, plants also have systems that move around their food and water. So in the plants, xylem and phloem are these continuous cells that form long tubes throughout the entire plant. And so xylem is primarily in charge of conducting water and dissolve nutrients from the root system to the shoot system. And phloem conducts sugars also known as glucose, which is produced by photosynthesis. It also conducts amino acids, hormones, and other substances from roots to shoots and from shoots to roots. So Let's talk about xylem. So xylem is a complex tissue that is made up of elongated dead cells that are impermeable to water. So they are water conducting cells. And they also have parenchyma cells and fibers. And the xylem is lignified, so it's, it's hard. So there are two types of water conducting cells found in the xylem. The xylem of all vascular plants contains tracheids with pits through which water moves. And in angiosperms, xylem also contains vessel elements with peripherations for water transport. So we'll see these two in the next slide. If you look at figure A, you can see these long tapered tubes, which have the pits, and these are the tracheids. In figure B, you will see the vessel elements which are found in angiosperm, so these are shorter and wide, but they are also tapered, and they have perforations as well as pits. And in C, you will see the tracheids and the vessel elements together in vascular tissue. Phloem is made up of living cells and they transport up and down throughout the plant. So phloem is a complex tissue containing two types of specialized cells, the sieve tube elements, which are long thin cells with perforated ends called sieve plates, and companion cells maintaining the cytoplasm and plasma membrane of sieve tube elements. So keep in mind that sieve tube elements lack nuclei and are directly connected to the adjacent companion cells by plasmodesmata. And we will go into this a little bit later to talk about sugar transport. If we look to the left, we will be looking at the sieve tube element. Adjacent to the sieve tube element will be the companion cell of many organelles. If we look closely, you can see that there's small perforations or holes along the sieve tube element. But here we see larger pores, which is the connection of the sieve plates. So this is where you will see one sieve tube element connecting to another one through the sieve plate. We can also see the sieve plates in a longitudinal section here, connecting one cell to another. And then we also see a cross section where we can see the companion cells directly adjacent to the sieve plates. Hopefully now you have a little bit better understanding of how the xylem and the phloem are structured in the plant. And so these vascular bundles are arranged differently in different parts of the plants. So it varies from the shoot system to the root system. So we're going to be going over how it's organized in the primary shoot system. So the stem or up to the leaves. The arrangement of these vascular bundles and ground tissue in the stem is different between monocots and eudicots. And so you can differentiate what type of plant it is by looking at the vascular bundles themselves. So in a eudicot, vascular bundles in the shoots are arranged in a ring near the stem's perimeter. The ground tissue is divided into the central pith and the outer cortex. And in a monocot, vascular bundles are scattered throughout the ground tissue. And so in the shoot system, they're organized this way to provide structure. That way the plant doesn't bend or get squashed easily. So we'll be looking at this in cross-section in the next slide. In figure A, you can see the cross-section of the eudicot stem. 
along the perimeter, you can see the xylem, phloem, and fibers, and the pith at the center. In figure B, we can see the cross-section of the monocot stem, where the smaller red circles are the vascular bundles, surrounded by a bunch of ground tissue, and they are all scattered throughout. It's kind of like little chicken pox. Now let's look at how the vascular bundles are organized in the root system. In the root system, they're arranged at the center of the root, which provides more protection for the vascular bundles. In a UE dicot, the bundles are arranged where the xylem is in a sort of cross-shaped at the center of the root, and the phloem is outside of the xylem. In a monocot, vascular bundles are located in a ring at the center of the cortex. And we will see this in the next slide. In figure A, we can see the cross-section of the monocot root, and at the center, in a ring, you can kind of see the xylem and phloem bundles that are present with the cortex on the outer perimeter of the xylem and phloem. Then if we look at figure B, you can see the cross-section of the UE dicot root, where the xylem is in this X pattern or cross-shaped pattern, and the phloem kind of surrounds itself around that X-shaped uh, xylem. And keep in mind that these vascular bundles in the root are specifically at the center because the roots kind of burrow into the ground, so they need a little bit more protection than at the stem. Now that we've looked at the xylem and the phloem, we're going to zoom out a little bit to see the larger complex system of where the xylem and the phloem are found, including the merry stems of the plant. So primary growth, growth extends the plant body. And this happens because there are many merisomes present in the plant body, and they are a population of undifferentiated cells that retain the ability to undergo mitosis, so they're constantly reproducing cells. Apical meristems are found at the tip of each root and shoot and are responsible for primary growth. The cells and tissues derived from apical meristems make up the primary plant body. The apical meristems, again, are found at the end of each shoot and root. And there are three distinct primary meristems that are derived from the apical meristem. So we have the protoderm, which gives rise to the dermal tissue system, the ground meristem, which gives rise to the ground tissue system, and the procambium, which gives rise to the vascular tissue system, including the xylem and the phloem. So when we look at these figures, figure A and figure B, if you look anywhere there's new growth, such as here in the bud, or at the tip of a shoot, or even at the tip of a root, this is where the apical meristem is found. And we can see the procambium, which is at the center of most of the structures. This is where the vascular bundles are found. We also can see the protoderm here, which is responsible for the outer skin of the plant. And then we also can see the ground meristems, which are also found in between the protoderm and the procambium. We have already learned how the vascular bundles are organized in the primary root system, and now we will be looking at the larger components of the roots. Let's start by looking at the root cap. The root apical meristem is protected by a group of cells called a root cap. The cells produced by the meristem constantly replenish the cap, which regularly loses cells, and this is because the roots themselves are always moving into the ground trying to find water and so that makes sense right they're constantly rubbing against other things so the cells are being lost the root cap also senses gravity to determine the direction of growth and secretes a slimy lubricant to reduce friction as the apical meristem is pushed through the soil so imagine them as little fingers that are pushing down into the ground so if you imagine that our cells are also kind of coming off as we put our hands down into the soil so the roots are doing that so they have a root cap to protect the edges and all the vascular bundles that are inside them. There are three distinct populations of cells that are also found behind this root cap. So without the protection of the root cap, these cells would not be able to elongate or grow in any way. The first one is the zone of cellular division. This contains the apical meristem as well as the protoderm, ground meristem, and procambium. Cells in the zone of cellular elongation, which increase the length of the roots, and cells in the zone of cellular maturation which differentiate into dermal, vascular, or ground tissue and absorb water and nutrients through root hairs. So let's go ahead and look at this in a figure on the next slide. Here we can see a longitudinal section of a root. At the bottom, we can see 
the apical meristem as we did in another figure before. This is the root cap with all the cells that are protecting the apical meristem. And so this is all found in the zone of cellular division. So this is where the growth is beginning. So as the root begins to reach down to the soil, we start seeing the zone of cellular elongation, which is where we see the vascular tissues, the ground tissue, and the epidermal tissues start to form. And as the root continues to reach down, we go up into the cellular zone of maturation, and this is where root hairs start to be produced to absorb water and nutrients. And we also may get lateral roots which are stronger roots in the root hairs. Everything we have talked about previously is talking about primary growth in a plant. So roots, the shoots, the leaves, the flower, but there's also secondary growth, which widens shoots and roots. So secondary growth increases the width of roots and shoots, increasing the amount of conducting tissue available and providing increased structural support. Secondary growth produces wood and occurs in species that have a cambium in addition to apical meristems. So we're talking about woody plants here. Since the plants need a cambium additional to the apical meristems to produce secondary growth, we need to know what cambium is. So cambium differs from an apical meristem because it forms a cylinder that runs the length of the root, trunk, or branch, and its cells divide to increase the width of the plant. There are two types of cambia in plants, the vascular cambia, which is located between the secondary xylem and secondary phloem, and the core cambium, which is located near the outer perimeter of the root, trunk, or branch. Now that we know what cambium is, we can talk about how cambium initiates secondary growth. So apical meristems allow for the plants to grow up and down, and cambium allows it to grow in width. So in the stem of a woody U dicot, a single layer of cell between the xylem and phloem becomes meristematic and forms a vascular cambium. Another ring of cells under their epidermis becomes meristematic and forms the cord cambium. Each cambium produces secondary growth each year, and secondary growth occurs in a similar fashion in roots. So in the cambium that is produced um, every year, this is where we can kind of see the, tr the tree rings in a tree. Here we can see a figure of what is actually happening with the secondary growth. So we can see the primary xylem down near the pith. And then we also see the primary phloem up closer to the cortex. And so this is happening because it's a woody plant. So keep in mind that all the water transport is happening in the actual wood of the tree. And the sugar transport is happening up in the bark. So here we have the vascular cambium. So wherever this cambium is, we're seeing the secondary growth, so the, the widening of cells. So here we can see the widening of the cells producing wood and the widening of the cells producing the bark. As we discussed a little bit in the previous image about what the vascular cambia does, it not only happens in the wood of the tree, but it also happens in the roots. So the production of secondary xylem and secondary phloem in this tube-like structures happens in both the roots and the shoots of the plants. Secondary xylem makes up wood, while secondary phloem makes up the inner part of the tree's bark. And the vascular cambium also produces sclerenchyma fibers and parenchyma cells formed in lateral rows of cells called rays. So I didn't discuss that in that image, but you can go back and see those in that image. Production of these tissues is highly asymmetrical with creation of more secondary xylem, which is retained and accumulates as wood. Now we're talking about the outer part of the tree. So here we have the cork cambium, which produces cork cells to the exterior of the trunk. Secondary phloem, cork cambium, and cork cells are part of what makes up the bark of a tree trunk. And gas exchange also occurs here through small openings called lenticels. I'm sure many of you guys have seen a cross section of a tree trunk. So we've all probably seen tree rings. And so this is going to explain why those tree rings actually occur and why we can see them and count them. So the older innermost secondary xylem accumulates protective compounds such as resins and gums. The dark colored inner xylem is called heartwood, while the light colored outer xylem is called sapwood. 
In areas with seasonality, the vascular cambrium stops growing during the dry or cold season. And so this results in the formation of annual tree rings with alternating early and late widths. So if you look at the tree rings, they're not always all the same color. They kind of vary in color, some darker and some lighter than others. And this is because of the seasonality that occurs where these trees are growing. So if you have not seen a cross section of a tree trunk, here's a really, really nice one. And so here you can see the darker wood. This is the heartwood and this provides structural support but is no longer transporting water. So it's not really alive, but it is providing structure to the tree. And then we can see the lighter part of the wood, which is called the sap wood, which includes active water conducting xylem tissues. And then we have the bark, the vascular cambium, and the cork, which is on the outer part. And so if you've ever heard of people who tap for like maple syrup from trees, they're tapping into the sap wood. And if they go all the way into the heartwood, well, they're probably not gonna get anything because it's no longer um, producing or conducting any type of a solute, it's just for support. Now we'll be focusing on sugar translocation, so we're going to focus back onto phloem and how sugar is transported in a plant. What is translocation? Translocation is the movement of sugars through a plant by bulk flow from sources to sinks through the phloem. A source is a tissue where sugar enters the phloem, and a sink is a tissue where sugar exits the phloem. Sugar concentrations are high in a source and low in sinks. And just keep in mind that sources and sinks aren't just one way, so we'll discuss that in a figure in the next slide. So translocation of sugars that occurs in a plant changes throughout the time of year because the sources and sinks vary based on how mature the plant is. So the location of sources and sinks in a plant varies with time of year and also seasonally. So early in the growing season, storage cells and roots and stems or sources will develop in leaves or sinks. So think of a sprout, the storage cells are the roots and the stems and the small leaves are sinks. And during the growing season, mature leaves and stems are sources, while merry stems developing leaves, flowers, seeds and fruits and storage cells and roots are sinks. So if you think about it, the mature leaves where photosynthesis is occurring and the stem this is all a source, while the meristems and the developing leaves, the flowers and fruits where sugars are going to and stuff is exiting are all sinks. This is a really nice figure showing a mature plant. So here we have sinks at both ends of the plant and a source at the center, which is the mature leaves and the stem, and the sinks, which include the fruits or the flower and the seeds and also the vascular tissue and the roots. Now we're going to go in a little bit deeper into the anatomy of phloem to talk about the translocation of sugars now that you know what the sources and sinks are in a plant. So the sieve tube elements have small and large pores, the sieve plates being the larger pores, which is where they are connected to one another end to end by the perforated sieve plates. And as the sieve tube members differentiate, they lose their nucleus, ribosomes, and vacuoles, and dictosomes. And so this is where the companion cells come into play because the companion cells are located adjacent to the sieve tube elements and help support their metabolism because they have many organelles, which assist in transporting of the sugars. Here we see the picture that we saw previously about the flow. So we can again see the smaller pores, and these assist in connecting the companion cells to the sieve tube element. And then the larger pores are located where the sieve plates are, and these help connect one sieve tube element to another one. And so phloem sap, which is a high concentration of sucrose, passes vertically through the pores in the wall between sieve tube elements. So here we can see the phloem sap moving down these sieve tube elements. Now that we know the anatomy, we can talk about the hypothesis, which helps explain how sugars are moved through the phloem, and this is called the pressure flow hypothesis. And so events at source and sink tissues are creating a pressure potential gradient in the phloem. So think about a hose, and when you have the hose open or closed, that is uh, changing the pressure of the water in the hose, determining whether it's going to come out or not. So the water and phloem sap moves down this pressure gradient and sugars are carried along by bulk flow. 
So the sources in the sinks are primarily responsible for creating this difference in trigger pressure where the flow is and generating the necessary force for it to move the sugars. Creating these differences in trigger pressure requires energy expenditure by the plant. So now that we know that the trigger pressure is responsible for moving the phloem, and we know that the sources in seeks are primarily responsible for adjusting this trigger pressure, we can talk about phloem loading. Phloem loading is when sucrose is moved by active transport from source cells through companion cells to seep tube members. So source cells being where the glucose is produced by photosynthesis, which would be in the leaves or the stem, and then that's transported through the companion cells and then into the sieve tube members and then down the sieve tube members into the roots. Water, on the other hand, flows passively flowing from the xylem into the sieve tube elements and then the trigger pressure builds in the sieve tube elements in the source region. So it's kind of like a cycle where the sucrose is moving by active transport against the gradient but the xylem is, the water is flowing uh, passively through the xylem and this is changing this, the trigger pressure allowing for this to be constant movement. Then we have phloem unloading. So in phloem unloading, cells in the sink remove sucrose from the phloem sap by passive or active transport. And then due to the loss of these solutes, we go from a high concentration to a low concentration. Water then flows passively and the trigger pressure in the sieve tube element drops. So I'm going to go over the pressure flow hypothesis with words and then we'll go over it in a picture which might make a little bit more sense. The net result of phloem loading and unloading is high trigger pressure near the source. So when we have high concentration of sucrose, we're seeing high trigger pressure. And then low trigger pressure near the sink, when we lose these solutes, which then drives phloem sap from source to sink via bulk flow. There is one-way flow of sucrose and a continuous loop of water movement as water flows between xylem and seed tube elements. So don't get confused because although xylem is primarily responsible for water transport and phloem is for sugar transport, they are working together because they are all connected in the system. So we'll look at the picture. It might make a little bit more sense then. We will do a little recap just to get the whole picture that's going on here. So the xylem is primarily responsible for the movement of water. And so we can see the water moving up in the xylem. And then we have the phloem, which is primarily responsible for the movement of the sucrose. And so if you recall, we say that the xylem moves from the roots to the shoots, but the phloem moves stuff from the shoots to the roots and the roots to the shoots. So at the end, when we're summarizing the hypothesis, it says that there is a one-way flow of sucrose and a continuous loop of water movement. So this might be a little confusing, but you have to keep in mind that the reason this is happening is because there is only one flow, one way flow of sucrose because it's moving from the source to the sink. But in a mature plant, we have sinks at both the top and the bottom of the plant. So it's still technically moving from the shoots to the roots and the roots to the shoots because we have sinks at both the top of the shoot and at the roots. Let's dissect this picture a little bit more. So now we'll go into talking about the pressure flow hypothesis with phloem loading and unloading. So the xylem, you can see that the water and the xylem sap is being moved via transportation pool. And so all of this requires energy expenditure. So it's being pulled up because there's 
food being produced in the sources of the plant. And so once the water is moving up to the xylem, it moves passively into the phloem and into the sieve tube elements. And so this is where we see the interaction of the xylem sap and the phloem sap. So we can see to the left, we see a source cell which is producing sugar. This is a leaf using photosynthesis creating sucrose. And so the sucrose begins to move actively because it's moving against the gradient into companion cell through the sieve tube elements and into the phloem. And this is where we see the high trigger pressure because we have a high concentration of sucrose. And so then it starts to move down because the sink starts to pull out solutes from the sucrose. And so it's reducing the amounts of solutes present in the, the phloem sap, allowing for this uh, kind of like bulk flow movement down. And so the phloem sap is moving via pressure flow. So it's just moving down the gradient at this point. So it could either move passively or actively. And then we see the water moving back into the xylem sap. And so this is just a continuous cycle that will be happening through the plant from the source to the sink. And keep in mind that there's also another sink up at the top of the plant, so this could be reversed. That will be the end of the lecture on xylem phloem and phloem loading and unloading on sugar translocation. Thank you, and I hope you all stay safe and healthy and your families are safe and healthy as well. And I hope you guys have a great weekend.